Hello and welcome to the Gov 101 podcast. I'm your host, Matt Creedle, Marion County's Legislative Manager. If you've had a chance to check out our Gov 101 video series, you know that Marion County created Gov 101, your guide to all things government here in Marion County, to highlight the multiple types of governmental offices operating in the county, some of their differences, how county services are funded, and much, much more. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, make sure you head over to our social media channels or our website to give it a watch. While the videos provide more of an overview of the topics, these interviews are designed to dig a little deeper. In this episode, we'll chat with Marion County Executive Director Mike McCain about discretionary sales surtaxes, as well as get a general overview of his role with Marion County. So now I'd like to welcome in Mike. Hello, Mike. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Matt. It's good to be here. Thanks for being here. So, Mike, let's start out with your role with Marion County. So you are an executive director. How is that different from a departmental director? Yeah, that's a good question. So as an executive director, I have a department that I'm in charge of. So I'm in charge of the Office of Fiscal Review. I'm in administration reporting up to the county administrator. But in addition, I have two departments that report up to me. So I have procurement services and I have 911 management. So those two departments report to you, and then you report directly to Monier, the county administrator. That's exactly right. So there's ACAs will have, um, so assistant county administrators will have multiple departments reporting to them, but they don't have a department that they run themselves. So that's the difference between an executive director and an ACA and an executive director and a departmental director. So you run your own department and oversee others as well. That's exactly right. And it's it's a little bit of a lighter load since I have my own department to run to. So in the most recent Gov 101 video, which is available, as I said, on Marion County's website, we talked a bit about Marion County's constitutional officers, but Mike, we also focused on aspects of the county's budget sources. So I know you know this, but property taxes are one source, but also so are sales taxes. And one of those sales taxes is currently on the ballot as a discretionary sales surtax, also known as the penny sales tax. So Mike, I would ask you first, is it an additional tax to the penny sales tax or is it an extension of the current infrastructure tax? Yeah, it's an extension of what we currently have. So we get a sales tax from Tallahassee. Um, but in addition, in um, 2016, we went to the voters and said, hey, we'd like an extra penny. And if you give us an extra penny, these are the projects we'll do. This is how we'll spend it. Um, voters approved it in 2016. It was for four years and we went back in 2020 and the voters approved it again. So here we are in 2024 with um, coming to the voters another time to get it approved. So it's so it's the 7% is what you're paying currently. That's what it'll stay the same if you if this gets approved. So it doesn't add and you're not paying 8%, it stays at the level it is. It should stay at seven, yes. So you mentioned projects, the penny sales tax funds projects. What kind of projects does the sales surtax uh, revenue fund? Well, it's really, it's, a, it's two-pronged. So it's public safety capital projects and it's road projects. Those are, it, that'll be on the ballot. That's what it'll say. This is what we'll do with the money if you approve these projects. You mentioned that it was approved in 2016. So the county started collecting the, the tax in 2016. We're now in 2024. What all has that paid for to this point? Sure. So when um, when we were first were collecting this money, so we were behind in equipment replacement. So it was ambulances, fire trucks, sheriff vehicles. So we did a lot early on replacing all of those vehicles, even um, even replace the helicopter for the sheriff. So we did that. And the quickest projects to do on the roads would be the overlays. So the roads that were in bad shape that needed to be overlaid. So we did a lot of um, road overlays. So then as the... Um, as it matured, we started building buildings. So we built an evidence building for the sheriff. We're building fire stations for the fire department. Um, we replaced radios early on in in um, the public safety communications department. Then we started um, putting up some more cell towers. We are um, and for roads, not just overlays. Now we're building new roads, and so that's the kind of um, so it's it's a progression. But that's the that was the idea. We kind of already touched on your bona fides as far as from the fiscal side, running the Office of Fiscal Review and then having procurement as well. But you're also a PE. So these engineering projects as well, they, you know, you, you kind of recognize the need for them and see they're being done in the most efficient manner, I would imagine. Yep. I love it. So that's exactly. And that's kind of what's driven me to this side of things is uh, that from the engineering point of view, it was how do you do things more efficient? How do you do things? How do you get cost savings? How do you do things better? And so that's kind of... Um, It's not always a natural jump to get into the office fiscal review and procurement and all that, but that's kind of what led me down this path. 
And I would imagine it's easier to connect when you're discussing these high level projects with the other project engineers or Monir himself as an engineer. So you can kind of have that connection and then work in language that they may understand and it may make sense for them. Yeah, I think you're right. I think sometimes it's easier if you, if you know the lang- lingo, if you can talk the language, and then you can um, be a nice interpreter, I guess, then for um, between engineers and non-engineers. And those conversations are great. And not only having conversations with county staff, you know, county commissioners, uh, Monir, but also having conversations with Marion County residents and people that live and work in Marion County. And I know sometimes you may not be having those conversations, but misconceptions do come up. And so maybe you come across a misconception online, you read something, or you are having a a conversation with a citizen or a resident in a board meeting, you're president in the front row of every single board meeting right there. So if people want to come and talk to Mike McCain, he's right there. So when you're having these conversations, there's misconceptions I would imagine that come up. So Mike, I'll, I'll ask some of the misconceptions that you kind of encountered regarding the penny sales tax. Sure. I I guess the concern, the big concern with any of this is, are you doing with the money what you're saying you're doing with the money? And so if you, if we give you this extra penny and you say you're going to use it for public safety, you're going to use it for transportation, are you then funding those sources less over in the other, in the other funds? And the answer is we're not. So the answer is that the, the sheriff has its, has an MSTU fund. That fund is not going down. Fire has, fire rescue has a, um, an assessment fund, that fund's not going down. Office of the County Engineer, they fund their their operations by the gas tax. That's not going down. So all of those are staying the same, but the addition is this sales tax. So this sales tax sits by itself. So you can go into the budget and look at it. You can go on the clerk's site, you can go on our site, but the clerk's site, the clerk of the court site, you go into his, it's called the budget line item document. You go in and you look at fund 3031, you can see this is the money we're expecting to come in. This is the money. This is where we're planning to spend it. So you can look at those different um, org codes, we call them. So you can look and see, hey, look, here's fire. Here's the sheriff. Here's transportation. And even inside those org codes, you can go in and look at these account codes. And so inside the account codes, you'll notice they're all they're all capital accounts. So when we spend money, we're going to spend it on land or we're going to spend it on machine equipment or we're going to sp- spend it on a building. What you don't see in there is you don't see personnel, you don't see operating supplies, you don't see any of those kind of things. So if we were using this money to supplement our operating, those line items would appear in there. They're not. The other thing you don't see in that uh, in that fund is you don't see transfer. So we're not transferring it out to the general fund to use it in other ways. So all the money coming in that fund is staying in that fund. It's getting spent on projects, and the other funds are not getting um, are are not taking a hit because of it. So, Mike, you mentioned that you oversee the county's procurement department. That's the the purchasing department for the county, pretty much. The state's procurement and the federal government's procurement system are pretty methodical, and it's not open to someone just saying, give money to this business or to person X. So, basically, this couldn't be a slush fund if if someone wanted it to be. No, there's um, there's so many checks and balances we have, I mean, which is a benefit being with the county. So, it's not just – so, we're pretty independent in terms of procurement reports up to me, and I report up to the county administrator. So we don't get undue pressure from any of the departments that we are purchasing for. And even on top of that layer, so we have uh, the clerk of the court has the, all the finance department over there. So the finance department has to approve these two. So we have procurement is going up through the county commission and then finance is going up through the clerk of the court. So even those two aren't, they don't oversee each other. So we have very independent overseers. And we kind of touch on a similar situation in the Gov 101 video when we talk about millage rates and Jimmy Cowan and the property appraiser's budget being separate than the BCC. There's that check and that balance where that's removed from from having oversight of someone who would be directly affected. It seems like there's a similar thing there, having the clerk of the court have this oversight as well of this account, and it's not simply overseen by the people who are collecting it. No, that's exactly right. And that should that should give the citizen some comfort. So the citizen should have some comfort that, hey, look, there's um there's an independence with this. There is checks and balances. In fact, I'd call it double checks and balances. It's not just that procurement's looking to make sure that fire's doing the right thing and that um the sheriff's doing the right thing. It's the clerk's even saying, hey, making sure procurement's doing the right thing. So we we have multiple layers. And so it um you know, you can call it red tape and bureaucracy if you want to talk bad about it, but we we tend to view it as a strength and a benefit that, we're, hey, look, it's not just that we think we're doing the right thing with the money. Here's another organization that says, yep, you're doing the right thing with the money. 
So my role with the county is, is as a legislative manager, I, I deal with a legislative process that is designed to be slow and prodding and deliberate and methodical. And it sounds like the procurement process is designed to be the same way. You're not just going to, you can't just run out and hire someone and pay them $50,000 an hour, uh, you know, with this money because they're a, a friend of a friend of someone. You can't pay anyone's salary. You can't pay anyone's benefits. That is all forbidden with the, the money that comes in as part of the penny sales tax. Absolutely. And we keep it in a separate fund. And that that's the way that we show discipline ourselves. When you put it in a separate fund, now it has to get spent on only those items. It can't get spent on anything else. So another another topic that comes up, Mike, is the uh, twenty year proposal on the referendum. That 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 topic comes up. That that time frame seems to be a topic of conversation. No, I I hear that. Um, so when we did when we went out the first time, we did four years, and so that's and when you look at what all the counties are doing through the state, four years is the lowest. No one's doing four years. Everybody's doing more. In fact. Half of the counties are doing 15 years and above. So we went out for four years. We were very pleased that the um, citizens approved it, and we did what we said we are going to do with the money. And so when we went for a renewal, we said, hey, this is what we did with the money. Here's what we're planning on doing this time, and the citizens approved it again. Where we've, What we've realized is, yep, that's really good for those short-term projects we talked about. That's really good for buying equipment. That's good for overlaying roads. It's good for easy road projects. What it's not good for is more complicated road projects. So in a road pro- a complicated road project, so you're going to have design. And so once you design it and you know where you're going to put the road, then you're going to start going and buying right-of-way. So that can take a while depending on how many property owners you have to negotiate with. Then once you um, have the property, you can start building. Now, we're building one road up there near a mine. And so it's very complicated to make sure we're doing all the right stuff. So when we do that, so the two options, if we have a, when we have a four-year project, four-year sales tax, the two options are we can pay for the um, design, pay for the right-of-way, and then assume that the citizens are going to approve the next sales tax. So that otherwise, and so if they, if they don't approve it, you're going to have a road design and, and land bought, but you're not going to be able to build it if they don't. The alternative is you say, okay, we're going to just save all the money that comes in. And so you're not spending money every year. You're saving it for this one project that you're doing the design, doing the right-of-way, building the road. And then it's going to take you, you know, maybe 10 years to do that. And in the meantime, you haven't spent all the money that you could be spending. So what the 20-year does for us, it makes it where we can get these um, quick projects out the door while we're working on these more complicated projects. And I would imagine having that flexibility is beneficial, especially with the growth that Marion County is seeing. Well, it's huge. And it's um, we don't want to be presumptuous that people are going to keep approving this um, penny sales tax every four years. So it, it makes it where it's very hard to plan when you're four years at a time. Easy to plan your one-year projects. Very hard to plan these projects that could take up to 10 years. You have to make, you, you're going to have to take a risk one or the other. We're going to risk designing a road, buying right away that may not get built, or we're going to take a risk that, hey, look, we're going to just hold on to this money until it gets built. And then, you know, everybody's looking at you saying, why aren't you doing stuff with this money? So I think we've touched on a lot of the misconceptions. Uh, any more you can think of? Not really. Um, so one of the things we just need to make sure that you understand. So this is money coming into the, so we control what happens at the um, county level. So this is a sales tax. It's also going to go to cities. So the cities will get to control what happens at their level. It's all going to be the same, but they'll have different projects, obviously, that, that they're doing. And that kind of dovetails into what we spoke about at the Gov 101 video, that, that different organizations or different um, government municipalities or districts control their own millage rates, their own taxes, their own rates, independent, and Marion County has no oversight or jurisdiction to tell them what to do or how to spend it. That's right. So they all report up to the citizens, up through their elected officials, and that's who... Um, that's who dictates that. So even though there may be different ones on the ballot, when you look at the ballot, each one of those has been placed by a different district or something of that nature. That's right. Okay. So that's all the time we have for this episode. I want to say a big thank you to Marion County Executive Director Mike McCain for his time today. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you being here. Matt, I enjoyed it. So be sure to join us for the next episode where we take a deeper dive into the topics covered in the Gov 101 video series. We hope you enjoyed this Gov 101 podcast episode, your guide to government in Marion County. Until next time, so long, everybody.